While most scholars agree that the Gilded Age has a set end date around 1900, a handful of people continue living as if the age never ended. Hi everyone, Ken here. Today we are heading off to the Berkshires to discover Bellefontaine. Hit that subscribe button and let's explore this house. This episode is brought to you in part by Victorian Society in America. More on them later. In 1850, Shiro Foster was born into great wealth. His family had made a name for themselves in coal, and his grandfather had expanded the family empire to include a lucrative mercantile business in New York City by the name of Foster and Giroux. By the time Giroux was born, he was considered old money and afforded every privilege in life. When he was of age, he joined with the family business, but what he really became best known for was being a socialite. Usually I go through the history and death before we get to the house tour, but today we have a lot to see, so let's just dive right in. In the 1890s, Giroux commissioned renowned architects Creer and Hastings to design for him a lavish mansion. Not only was it to be inspired by classical architecture with every beauty afforded by the Beaux-Arts, it was to be the most ornate summer home in the Berkshires. The mansion had its roots in French design, and each piece of furniture was to be imported from France. Beyond that, entire rooms were designed and assembled in Paris before being shipped overseas and reassembled on site. As we continue rotating about the mansion, which he named Bellefontaine, the French inspiration becomes evident with a mix of red brick decoratively framed by large limestone blocks. Having a house of such magnitude wasn't enough by itself to fit the needs of someone with such a social standing. Giro was an avid equestrian and required grounds for riding his horses and playing polo. Beyond that, he was known to go for a three-mile walk every day through his lavish gardens. Some of his daily sights would have included the parterre garden where he could wind about its pea gravel paths in solitude. Next he might venture towards the reflecting pool, overflowing with lily pads and surrounded by uninterrupted lawns, perfect for letting the dogs run free. Though it is the nondescript paths on the edge of the dense forest which will lead to the most intrigue. After traveling down dirt roads, we emerge from the thick canopy to find formal gardens and statues marking our promenade. Ponds are scattered about and teeming with koi swimming below the reflections of marble statues. While we could spend days retracing Giroux's three-mile path, I think it is about time we made our way back to the house. We emerge from the tree-lined path centered on a stone fountain set at the perfect distance from the mansion so as to frame it with statues looking forward. At the end of the reflecting pool is another fountain in the court, only one of the entryways for the mansion. Had we arrived by buggy, we would have made a circle around that fountain and then traveled around the wing to the porte cochere. However, there is no better place to begin our tour than from the main entrance below the portico. Before we head inside, a quick word about the sponsor of today's video, Victorian Society in America. Are you obsessed with historic architecture? Have you ever wanted to go beyond reading and learning to actually experiencing historically and architecturally significant sites? With the Victorian Society in America, you can travel to American cities and tour exceptional 19th century buildings. Join the Victorian Society in America this October for an educational tour in St. Louis, Missouri. The itinerary is packed with exciting visits to key architectural sites, landscapes, and artistic gems in and around the greater St. Louis area. Click the link in the video description to visit victoriansociety.org and register today. Thank you Victorian Society in America for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get back to our tour. To find the front door, we'll climb stone steps, heading beyond vine-covered retaining walls, potted plants, and urns overflowing with flowers. Entering the mansion, we arrive in the stair hall lined with marble statues standing proudly against frescoed walls. To the other end of the hall, the grand staircase ascends in strict form, with each step having been crafted from a single marble block and anchoring an incredibly intricate wrought iron balustrade. The dining room was finished out with rich wood wall paneling boasting gilded accents and wall murals, all of which were crafted in France before being shipped to the Berkshires. For the many social events held in the house, the dining room table could be extended as needed, being able to seat up to 60 guests when all of its leaves were in place. Though the breakfast room is where we might imagine the Foster's dining when not entertaining. Giro wanted the house to blend indoor and outdoor living, allowing him to fully seize the summer season. With that in mind, the loggia would be cleared out for entertaining his male friends in place of a smoking room. And in his later years, when he moved to Bellefontaine full-time, he kept hold of this notion regardless of the seasons. A series of greenhouses allowed him to enjoy hot and humid walks amongst flowering plants year-round when the grounds were otherwise covered in snow. He enjoyed the house until his last breath when he passed away here in 1945 at the age of 95 years old. The house was then sold with all of its furnishings transferring to the next owner, but despite their intentions of keeping this late remnant of a Gilded Age lifestyle ongoing, something tragic happened. A fire broke out a few years later and completely consumed the interior of the mansion. 
The fine French furniture and architectural finishes went up in flame, and by the time the fire quelled, only the brick and stone facade remained. Thankfully, Career and Hastings were masters of design and over-engineered their building to last for hundreds of years if not longer. The shell of the once great estate stood strong and was able to have its interiors rebuilt. Even though so much was lost, we can find solace in knowing that what survived the fire has continued to survive to this day. And while it is no longer a private residence, it is enjoyed by those who visit the present-day spa resort which occupies Bellefontaine. What did you think about the mansion? Let me know down below in the comments section. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Victorian Society in America for sponsoring today's video. Check out their upcoming tour linked in the video description. As always, thank you all for watching and make sure you're subscribed with that bell notification turned on so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.